just to be respectful of, of our guest time, we're going to go ahead and start at six. So the story starts with entrepreneurship, and entrepreneurship is an unbelievable opportunity to innovate, to improve, to make things happen. And both of our guests this evening have been and are on that journey. It is not frequent that we have people in academia who are also entrepreneurs, okay? And you would say, well, uh, I haven't heard of Professor Ragland. Well, he doesn't, doesn't actually teach a class, but he is on the board of trustees uh, at St. Edwards University. And he also has been on the advisory council at the Vista School. He has been president of our alumni society when it was a more rebellious type of operation. Uh, and he has been, um, he's survived me. I, he was a former student of mine. And uh, little did I know that I was going to intersect uh, with Chris Raglan. Uh, more than once and it's been for me a very enriching uh interaction i've learned a lot from him uh continue to do so but one of the things that he established uh in my mind is if i ever needed a guest speaker in my class that kept people awake and that kept people there after the class ended for as long as he could stand it it was chris Ragland. um he has done a magnificent job of engaging students in the classroom in a, a best practices manner. And it's because he knows what he talks about. But more importantly, he has also been involved with us as a student some years ago, uh, traveled abroad and has done a phenomenal job of leveraging his resources and his contacts to give back to St. Edwards and to give back to us as members of our community here, students. Um, I, I will not say very much other than to indicate I called him because we still have his um, tutorial on funding uh, startups, which he did when he was uh, one of the leaders of uh, Noble Capital here in Austin, a venture that he was involved with, and he has moved on and now has other ventures. But uh, would, would you help me uh, welcome uh, Chris Ryan? Uh, Professor Muller uh, has been kind enough to invite me into his ecosystem, uh, along with others. I think Dr. Ward is, is another uh, invitee. And you probably have not heard of Keweenaw Mountain Lodge, but you will. <laughs> oh, you, you have, okay. So uh, that is one of his entrepreneurial ventures. He is a serial entrepreneur and um he has been involved in his background you want to know about golf he's done it you want to know about <laughs> craft beer he's been there uh you want to know about rocky mountain highs the legal ones uh he's been there <laughs> okay uh you want to know about other universities where he has taught and many of our professors here today will share their experience but there's really no place that I've been involved with uh, in the entrepreneurial space, conferences that I've been to, where I haven't somehow mentioned St. Edwards or mentioned uh, John Muller, and they go like, oh, yes, we, we knew him when he was at Fresno State, and he did the following. Or, you know, uh, yes, um, in one of the first um, investments we did in Austin, we did through, uh, you know, John Muller. So, I cannot say enough about what he has done and contributed as a professor of management in the School of Business over the last few years since he's been here. And he has also volunteered, uh, and I say volunteered in a kind of advised way to lead uh, students on international uh, trips. Um, and sometimes it's like herding cats because uh, students, after they leave the confines of the United States, become a little dangerous and sometimes wild, but uh, it's been a very productive uh, experience. He has uh, written and contributed to a number of um, peer research uh, articles and uh, in the venture finance space, I don't think there's none better uh, than Professor John Muller, native Austin I. Let's welcome him. 
So it's going to be a conversation. So Chris and, and John, I'll leave it to you as to how you want to uh, present. <laughs> Uh, where do you want us to start? I mean, we have a lot to talk about. Um, I guess I'll jump in. Um, so yeah, real quick, just some more background. Uh, I did my undergrad here. I graduated in 05, uh, a little late. Um, I was the first class to have the entrepreneurship designation. So every single class that I took in the business school, the professors would always start off with, this is the first time we've ever taught this class. So bear with us. <laughs> it was really a unique experience because it was the same like five to seven of us, almost like a cohort going together and through this journey, which was really special. Um, and then I came back in 2010 and got my MBA as well. As Tony mentioned, um, that was a part of a program. That we did a tremendous amount of study abroad. Um, so I, I think I, I hold the record for a number of study abroad courses for a single student. I think I did something like eight or nine different countries. So it was a lot of fun. Um, on the business side, I started my first company when I was 17 in high school. Um, this was uh, now a long time ago, considered in some tech years. This is before broadband internet existed, what we think of as the internet, right? And I helped start what was called an internet service provider. And we basically sold um, telephone line access to people with modems to gain access to the very beginnings of what would become the internet. That was my first company, right? And I did that when I was in high school. It was a very fascinating, rewarding experience. Um, since then, I've done a number of different things in different fields. Um, someone asked me this question the other day, and I was embarrassed not to be able to tell them. I actually do not know how many companies I've helped start or been a part of. I think it's somewhere in the 70s at this point. Um, I invest in companies passively, actively. I run businesses. I close down businesses, right? Because it takes a lot of uh, uh, effort to do that too, unfortunately. Um, I don't have an area of expertise any longer. When I first started, I thought uh, the most important thing about a company was your product or your service. What else could it be? Um, you know, and then when I got a little bit older and I was raising money, serious money for companies, I started to realize at that time, um, my thought was the most important thing in the business is does it make money? It's no longer about a good idea. Does the damn thing make money? You know, it's really important. And can I raise capital for this thing? Do I understand the finance, the cash flow, all the things that I'm going to talk about? Uh, and you know, now that I'm a little older and a little wiser, and I've failed a few more times, uh, what I know is, you know, it's not about so much the idea, and it's not about how great the company's cash flow statement looks. It's about the leader's ability to execute. Because no matter how good or poor the idea is, it's about your ability as a founder, as a leader, to execute effectively. That's the most important thing. Maybe in 10 years, I'll answer the question a little bit differently, but that's where I stand right now. So I think I'm going to focus a little more on some of the finance stuff, but I just wanted to kind of introduce myself a little bit so we have a little bit more context. Eight study abroad courses. Yeah, it was <laughs> excessive, but really a lot of fun and very rewarding. When I was at Western Michigan University, we did a study in the States. Mm -hmm. So we went to Boulder, Colorado, went to Austin, Texas, went to Chicago, went to Detroit, um, and had 10 students. Um, some of them hadn't been outside the state of Michigan at that time. Wow. Um, and so that was about understanding the ecosystems in those areas. So Boulder, doing really well, vibrant, Austin, kind of thing. This was 2015, one of those students who'd never been outside of Michigan did the same thing after that. <laughs> went and did eight different study abroad, <laughs> went to South Africa, went to Italy, and so forth. Oh, yeah. So um, once you get the bug, yep. it is tough to get the international uh, flavor out of it. Same thing with starting a company. I was just going to say, <laughs> you talk about the sickness of entrepreneurship. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, you know, it goes back to loving the idea and then executing on that idea and finding the uh, um, the founder fit, finding the product market fit, finding um, where the cash flow is eventually, but it doesn't necessarily have to be the first first thing there. So, um, so my background is uh, native Austinites. I grew up here in Austin, so I've seen it kind of change a little bit from um, different perspectives. There was 350,000 people here in Austin. Now there's 2.2 plus, depending on how you calculate the MSA here. Uh, my family's been here since the early 1900s. Uh, my uh, grandpa, great grandfather, I should say, came from Germany. Um, basically, when he was in his teens, he 
He was the first um, manager of Kakashu Lumber Company um, on the river down here in the early 1900s. And so what he saw as an entrepreneur was basically people buying wood to go build the houses. He would watch where they're building houses and he'd buy a property a mile or two past that and then hold the property for 10 plus years and so forth, even more. Um, we end up selling a property um, that we had in the family um, a couple of years ago that was 80 years in the family um, because of that mentality. And so uh, my grandfather um, ended up doing something similar to that. Um, he did get a civil engineering degree uh, at the University of at BMI and then a grad at UC and then continued that legacy in the real estate piece there. And then my dad did the same thing. And then I decided to leave Austin <laughs> um, for 30 years, actually. And so I lived outside um, in Boulder, Colorado, Walmart area for a little bit. So I went and did my PhD at Louisville, Kentucky um, in entrepreneurship, which uh, talk about teaching things for the first time. A PhD in entrepreneurship was unheard of 20 years ago. Uh, Indiana University did the first one with the grads coming out in 2004. Um, Louisville did the second one as a pure PhD in entrepreneurship. We focus on entrepreneurship and look at from economics, from finance, from sociology, from marketing, and so forth. And so, you know, even in the academic world, we learn how to be a pioneer, you know, in different aspects in terms of different programs, uh, you know, at different levels and so forth. And so after 30 years, come back to Austin in 2017, uh, near St. Ed's for five years, enjoyed it with the uh, fellow colleagues and the students. And so um, started a couple of companies, um, also invest in companies these days. Um, you know, my focus is as an impact investor. And so I look at things like climate tech, ed tech, and so forth, um, and combine both the connection pieces um, with um, the, the return. I mean, so, um, you know, one of the biggest questions is, you know, how do you get people to invest in a company? And what I've you know, come into is um, connections. And so it's a connection with the people, it's a connections with the market, it's connections with the finances of the company, um, it's the connections with the, um, the, the, the problem and the solution, how you come about that piece there. Uh, lots of research and trying to figure out if it's the horse or the jockey, um, or it's a combination of that piece there. Uh, what I found, you know, anecdotally and looking at from a research standpoint is, is that connection first, and then it could be multiple pieces to it because they haven't really been able to lock it down in terms of, is it one thing or the other, the jockey or the horse? And now there's some research out there that says angel investors care more about the jockey, um, and the VCs care more about the, the horse, which is the market and the, the idea itself. But at the end of the day, they find out it's a combination of those things. There's so many different variables um, that are involved with that piece there. From my you know, impact, inspect, uh, impact investment piece, I look at three times you know, return within a five or seven year period. Uh, you know, venture capitalists are going to look at it from seven to 10 times within that period. Um, but usually you'll see angel investors at a lower level piece so they invest early on. Um, I have ranges from pre seed, which was not a term three to five years ago. All right, they started at seed. And, well, actually, it was the you know, family, friends, and fools. You know, it was founders and family, friends, and fools. Then it was uh, in the um, seed. And then you go into some institutional, the, the seed would be angel investing. And then you'd have a combination of some angels, um, super angels, and institutional money, BC, the series A, BC, and so forth. But then you also had the new term, which is something the last years extensions so you have a seed extension so there's terms are changing all over the place for things and so this conversation today um from how you actually talk to investors and how you actually get external funding and how you you know can show people that you can execute is a big thing um i'm working with a company um, the founder i should say out of uh, california where i was in fresno um that actually you know is doing um you know farming the box you know, so you actually have a chef that can make a, a arugula and grow it in seven days and so forth. Tons of ideas, right? You know, the entrepreneurs, you know, a great idea. The question is, can you execute on it? And so, you know, I, you know, for three months, every day for an hour, I sit with them and, and work with, get it to where you can focus on it. And so what I tell people is write your ideas down so then you can take them out of your mind, all right? And then really work on the one that's going to actually get you to step A, step B, and step C. And so, um, that's a connection that I have with this founder. And so that's how we've gone. And so it's a combination of things that I enjoy. 
um, as well as you know what I think is kind of the um, if, if he can execute great, but he's having trouble executing. Um, but a great person, you know, and and, and so forth. And so um, we'll see, you know, how that how that. Uh, and I'll turn it back over to you, Chris. So I'm um, going to um, some more stuff. Yeah, sure. I, I know Tony, of course, gave us, Dr. Alvarado gave us, uh, you know, assignments here in terms of things we're supposed to cover. Um, you know, I'm supposed to be a little bit more on the finance side and uh, kind of, you know, the real juicy stuff. <laughs> um, and I, I had a good mentor here. Um, some people in the room may remember uh, him, but Dr. Les Carter, he was a big finance guy, retired banker. And I was not great at finance. I was not that great at it. I was okay. Um, but like now I'm pretty good at it. <laughs> and having owned an alternative bank now for a while and, and sold that company and, and started a few other businesses, it's given me a much greater appreciation for it. But to kind of bring it back home to what you're doing, like you were literally like in a startup phase, you know, and hopefully you're participating in the I challenge competition and all this stuff here. Like there are some really fundamental things that are important and they're not really terribly difficult. They don't have to be intimidating at all. Right. So I want to break it down for you and just give you kind of like a list of maybe five things that if you know and you can build yourself. It's pretty easy. It'll be impressive to anyone that's talking to you if you're raising seed or pre-seed money. <laughs> um, so like the first one, is, you would think this would be kind of basic, but people forget this in presentations, believe it or not. But you need to know like, what are you, your ask? Like how much are you asking for and what's it gonna go to? In the banking world or finance world, we call this sources and uses, right? So it's how much money are you asking for from everyone? So we'll break that down in a second. And where is it going? So it's literally a detailed list, like in Excel, of all of the stuff in the table. This is my startup capital. This is what it's going towards. Everything from my formation documents, my legal fees, my brand and my website, my prototype, like everything. Think about what you think you need to get all the way to a viable business. And, and viable business doesn't necessarily need to be profitable. It needs to be getting that first dollar coming in that door, right? Did you actually get out and test the marketplace? Could you get that far? Right? That's all we're talking about here, the prototype. Can it work? You know, like I think I saw somebody on a food trailer and you've all kind of given me your, your ideas, you know, like reusable bike tires and stuff. It's like, can you get to a potential prototype and talk to a store that might buy your thing, okay? That is your first set of money that you need to raise. You gotta get that far. So having that is really important, but also talk about where the money is coming from. Your investor wants to give you money because they want to invest in your idea, in you, and they want to get a return, but they also want to know who else is investing in your idea. And that's something that tends to be opaque and, and should not be. Be fully transparent. How much money are you putting in this deal? How much money is your friends or your family putting into this deal? Are there other investors? Will you be treated differently? Are you going to have different classes of shares? This is, can get complex if you want to, but don't need to keep it super simple. How much money is coming in from whom and where's the money going for what? Pretty basic, right? So that's one of the like, most important things you need to have. And by the way, it's on the grading rubric for the, for the high challenge. You need that. <laughs> <laughs> the next thing you're gonna really need is some basic expectation of what's gonna happen when you roll out your business, right? We've already spent the startup capital at this point. I'm talking about a very, very basic financial projection. What is your intention? And this ties into everything else. What's the price point, right? If you're going to say, I'm going to make this much money over the first three years, that has to tie into what is your price point into how many people are you selling and how big is the addressable market? Those are four other things that are in your creating rubric. You need to understand because all of these things plug in together when you start looking at the numbers. The numbers really don't lie. They show investors and should show you where maybe you haven't thought through something yet, right? If you start to build your projections on your sales and your revenue, and you can't really tie it into how big the market is and how many people you're selling to, you've already got a fundamental problem that you need to address. So you got the revenue side, right? How I'm selling, and then you have your expenses. And one of the big things that I see on expenses is left out is you. A lot of founders are really guilty for this, right? They will try to make it work. They'll force it to work. And they'll take themselves out 
of the payroll. And like that's a big, really one example of a lot of mistakes that people make. But what I'm trying to use is I just highlight that your expenses need to be thought out and they need to be complete. If I was to invest in your company, I need to know that the company can be potentially successful based on these expenses. And also, I want to know that everything's in there. I don't want to know that you're building in pure sweat equity and relying on goodwill of your parents or someone else to keep you alive. I need to know you're interested, you're rewarded, and you want to have some buy-in, right? So I'm not going to pay you very much. I don't see all of a sudden I became your boss because I'm your investor. By the way, that's what happens. That's a really good lesson to learn too. But I want you to be successful and I want you to be okay to be able to pay your bills and be able to move forward. So all of your expenses need to be plugged in. And I guarantee you, the first time you ever do this exercise where you put up your sales and you start putting up your expenses, it won't work out. <laughs> Almost every time when you're building these projections, it's going to be a disaster the first time. And you're going to have to rethink your idea, your price point, what you can sell it to the market for. Is it even competitive enough to get that price point? Are these expenses real? Do I really need these things? Can I eliminate X, Y, and Z? Because you're trying to make the numbers work and show people it's profitable, right? So that's the dilemma for a startup is you're always trying to understand, is this viable? Can this even work? And until you sit down and build your financial project projections, it's really hard to understand if it's going to work or not. The other thing that I didn't see directly on your grading rubric, but I think is really important, is to think about your assets and your liabilities, right? We're talking about fundamentals of the balance sheet. You need to know what's on your balance sheet from the standpoint of what's valuable in your company. Right? There's things there that are going to be valuable if you're a, a very um, you know, physical-oriented company. If you're making widgets and your tires, right? those things are valuable. They're inventory. And you're going to have cost of goods sold that go into those inventory components. It's all worth money. But you may have something else. You may have brand value. Right? You may have goodwill, like all these other weird kind of things that you need to kind of consider. At least spend a little time understanding what are the assets that you have. Because that really has to start to match up with the other side of it, which is your liabilities, you know, if you have any. Here's the cool thing for startups that are being self-funded or funded by friends and family. A lot of times you have no liabilities on day one. <laughs> That's magic. That's great. You have no debt. <laughs> it's wonderful. Um, but that matches up with the last piece, and this ties all the way back to that beginning and that source is where, where's the money coming from? Is your owner's equity in the balance sheet? You're trying to understand, like, can I create significant new value on the asset side of my balance sheet, which can be in the form of retained earnings, right? The profits, or maybe I'm making something, maybe my idea has patent worthiness, and that's the value that people are going after, and that balances out on the balance sheet. With the equity that's what people are trying to create is more equity here and there's only two ways to do it right we're going to create assets or we're going to create revenue which from an accounting standpoint turns into assets for a moment before it gets converted into owner's equity so that's what we're trying to do here from a financial standpoint right so let's just recap really quickly we've got my sources and uses how much money am i raising where is it coming from and where is it all going and by the way the, the sum that's the same numbers <laughs> There's not a source of 100 and a use of 80. If you wanted to keep some on reserve, that's fine. Now you have a use of 20 that's a reserve account, right? But these are the same dollar amounts. I want to know where every dollar is going. Now I need to see some projections. And inside the projections, I want to see projections of your revenue, projections of your expenses. And then I would love to see some form of a balance sheet or a cap table, right? A capitalization table. We're talking about who owns and what percentages of the company. Got to be really clear about this. You know, Dr. Mullen threw out a couple of terms. He's like three times my money. You know, start you start to figure out math and where this comes from pretty quickly. He gave you one answer in an early stage investor. You can back into his number into your plan now, and you can do this with any investor if you know what they want. He just said in three years I want to see three times on my money. So if you're coming to him and asking for him for fifty thousand dollars. Okay, so I got to at least get this guy $50,000. That's $150,000. Now I got to back all the way into does his equity component that I'm giving him turn into $150,000 in three years? And if the answer is no, he's not your guy, unless he's got some other motivation to give you money. 
but usually like you can actually answer your question and this kind of boils down to know your investor first off you know he's an impact investor so if you have an impact component you've already got a leg in the door over someone who's just out there trying to make some money great good for you now you know he wants to make three times on his money in your mind are you thinking about enough equity to give him to get him three times on his money in three years according to your business plan it's all math right in front of you you can actually answer the question and that's really great because if you can just show him that and you're an impact business you should invest so anyway hope that's helpful and i think i covered about six things on your grading rubric so that was nice <laughs> you want to fill in some holes yeah that's right <laughs> yeah. that's right <laughs> so uh... <laughs> that, you know, on the utility plan, which is really good on that. So I'm going to ask you a question. Okay. All right. And that'll be a discussion that we can have uh, in front of everybody with this. So, so I, I talk about three times within five, seven years. Three times. Three oh, times he's giving three, you a lot more time. Yeah. Three, three times in three years <laughs> is, is, is pretty, pretty That would be pretty amazing. Yeah. On that. So, and, and I, and I have a spectrum, you know, precede and, and go into series, you know, different series, and on what I'm, I'm in at that time. And, on the follow-on now that piece there so you coming from a different angle what is what would you tell you know someone they let you know if you, you know if you want me to get to know as opposed to yes i, I tell people try to get the investor to say no as quick as possible because that happens if you get and you fail to say no then you got a possible yes right um it, it's when you spend so much time trying to get someone to say yes you wasted your time and so you want to get really quickly to know so then you know to go somewhere else all right so what would be some of the turnoffs for you all right so flip that around that would you know not make you invest or get you excited to invest in a company okay well first off i totally agree with you on the no comment i, I had a, one of my many business partners i've had over the years business partners by the way is like getting married um you know, love each other, hate each other. Hopefully, down the line, you can make something you're proud of. Okay, so I have a business partner who I don't terribly respect as a person anymore because it happens. But he had a lot of really good sayings, <laughs> and one of his saying was, "I always appreciate a fast no over a long yes," and he's spot on. That's some wisdom right there. Because if someone tells you no and they mean it, and you think they mean it. You just move on. It is a numbers game. Pitching to investors. First off, you gotta have your stuff ready. <laughs> do not waste my time. And now I'm answering the first, my first answer to your question. Is do not come to me unprepared. If you come to me unprepared and it's obvious, then you've already represented how I'm gonna think you're gonna handle everything. You know, so if you've got a great idea, great. Maybe you can hint at it and tell me. I would even tease it out. Hey, I've got a really great idea for recyclable tires for bicycles, but I'm not ready yet. But when I am, can I pitch it to you? Oh man, I already love you. Yeah, here's my card. Thank you for not wasting my time and trying to pitch me an idea that's not ready. But that's a pretty neat idea. Call me when you're ready. So don't waste my time is a huge one. I, I absolutely hate. But I'll give you one more example is the cookie cutter hockey stick is what it's called. Financials. I dig into financials a lot because for me, financials answer a lot of questions. And when I see these just absolutely ridiculous, you know, I'm gonna spin, 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 hey, we just make a bazillion dollars. You know, it's like, no, you're not. And that's because you you may think you are, but what happened is you actually haven't thought through the real world. That's not how it works. And then the last one, I'll give you another example. These are just real quick turnoffs. Is when someone tells me. The market size is this big, and all we're going to do is get 1% of the market, and that will translate into this much revenue and by this time. Mm. It's over. Like, literally, I'm gone. <laughs> like, you just, you are literally just making something up. You're saying, like, surely I can get 1% of the market, right? No, you haven't addressed anything. I don't even know if your idea will sell at all. I have seen companies build products and sell zero of them. You're not for sure going to get one percent just because it's a small number. So those are some big turnoffs. So let's, let's look at that that hockey stick and the J curve too. They so call it dip in below zero and come back up. Right? Yeah, yeah. And maybe the, the value of death. Yeah, they get the, the value of the you know the first two or three years, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and if you get across that chasm, mm -hmm. then then you're pretty good. 
um, you might make it after that. So um, that'll be good. So we're talking about financials and that, that projections. Um, and I look at it, say 99% of the time, those projections are wrong. What I look at it and say, I care about the assumptions that build that stuff, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, it's, your, your model is only as strong as your assumptions. You know that things are going to change. So then you know where the levers are, then you'll be good. If you're a, a, a pre revenue company, and that could be, you know, we get you know, family and friends, pre seed and seed, do you still look at that? Um, hmm. Not always is the truth. Uh, if I'm investing early, right, very early, then it's not as relevant. But I like to use it as an exercise. It tells me you've thought through what will happen in the future. And I can get a glimpse into how you think and behave with your assumptions in the future, even if you're not there yet. Right, we're talking about companies that take a decent amount of time to be built before they get to revenue pre revenue companies. You know, this tends to be more common than, say, like software industry and stuff like that. Um, even in like, you know, like the gaming industry, I saw some one of the group has like a game kind of concept. Sometimes it takes a long time. And then you're way more focused on like IP, um, you know, creative talent, but the actual management team, the talent team, your ability to take something to market. Those things start to become the most valuable people on the team. So not always, um, but for me, what you've just uncovered is my bias towards where I like to invest in companies. Um, I don't like to invest in pre-revenue companies. I like, I like to be right there when they've started to show. And I know that means I miss out sometimes. I'm not, I'm not getting the best deal <laughs> if they've already proven they can go out to market. So they'll have at least one dollar. On the top. <laughs> I'd love to see at least a buck. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, yeah. You look at all the pitch decks that, that are coming out now for those you know, pre seed and seed, and um, a lot of them don't have you know those, those, those financials in there. So um, you know, you look at that, and you know that means the company you know it was where you, know, you saw it three, four, five mil. You know, in terms of you know pre or post valuation. Interesting enough, they're seeing like 20 now. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, the average in the last two years has been pretty high. Yeah. How many deals do you look at each month um, that you say no to versus how many deals do you say yes to? So you have the noise versus the signal. Uh, I almost have to do it by week instead of month because I, I do look at a lot of deals. Um, if I use roundabout numbers, I don't seriously, okay, I seriously look at and drill into, maybe I'm just a little crazy, but I, I probably about 20 a month. Yeah, I'd say two to three, top end would be five a week, depending on travel. That's what I do on airplanes. I look at business plans and stuff and pitches and financial statements. Those are so much fun. Um, the assumptions that go right. That's the real, and that's the valuable part, right? That's the plus, the input. That's all that really matters. Like, you can build a, a fancy pro forma and Excel spreadsheet. I can build a really great one. I do that in my sleep, and I can, I can do it in ten minutes. I can literally build from scratch, like a brand new spreadsheet on Excel, and build a whole pro forma in ten minutes and blow your mind. I'm not impressed when you can do it. I don't care, but I really care because I can do that. I don't need you to do that. I need you to show me you know your market. So I look at about twenty a month. At the most, maybe as low as 10 on a slow month. And I'm very, very surprised if I do more than one. Really, honestly. And then the funnel's higher than, you know, there's more above that. I just ignore a ton of deals that, that don't. Real quick note. A real quick note. Right. I don't understand that space. See, it. like literally, and that's a big role for me. If I don't understand your space or I'm not willing to take the time to understand your space, it's a fast no. I've never done a lot of biomedical stuff, right? Um, but recently, I have a really good friend of mine who is very deep in biomed, putting some really fascinating stuff together. And so I told him, okay, I'm going to have to learn about your space. And I'll never know as much as you, but I have to understand the fundamentals of your space and some of the histories. Because for the longest time, many years, in fact, someone brought me a biomed deal, like yours, for example. I'm like, cool, it sounds like a really neat thing. I really don't understand medical and biomedical. I just have to pass. Here's three other investors that might be interested if you ask me that question, <laughs> right? But I'm going to pass, right? So, I, I, yeah, off the top, a ton. Or if it's just a, a really bad way of, of, like, I'm really turned off with the robo LinkedIn connection. Um, 
hey, I've got this idea, this business thing, and I can tell it's a form. I don't, I'll never answer those. Yeah, really. Yeah. It needs to be that connection. Yes. And if your friend, for example, with the biotech piece there. It's a relationship. Yeah, it's not coming across the answer. No. And so, so you look at that signaling, talk about, you know, where the money comes from. So, you know, if you had floodgates, you know, Mike Maples coming in to deal, um, how does that affect if you're going to look at it? Yeah, good question. So he's talking about like the value of having a lead investor or a friend investor and do they bring other people with them, the signaling kind of concept. Yes, there are a few investors that I know if they're in your deal, I trust their due diligence process enough where I'm like, okay, I will only spend like one fifth the amount of time reviewing this that I would normally because you've already got my buddy Mike in your deal and Mike really knows his stuff. So there's... That's pretty big. Yeah, that's a shortcut for investors for sure, which is why for you, when you get an investor, first off, congratulations, you got an investor. That's already the biggest thing you can possibly hope for as an entrepreneur. Really, it's, it's, it's the hardest thing. And then the next hardest thing will be actually getting your company up and running. Um, but if you get an investor, it shocks me how few entrepreneurs go to that investor and say, well, do you have anyone else that you think would appreciate to see this? That's all it takes. They may say no, and okay, you didn't waste any time. And they're not going to be offended that you ask them for any of their buddies. Um, smart investors, when they see something they really like, and they're not able to fund your whole deal, will call their cadre of friends. Because they know if I commit, and you don't, you're not fully raised, my capital is at risk. Think about this for a moment, right? If you're raising a quarter of a million dollars, and I'm in for 50K, and that's all you've got, and maybe I find out you've only got one more guy, so now you're at 100K, but you need 250. I love your deal, and I thought it was a great idea. Like, I should call my friends, and, and you need to tell me that. <laughs> When's the best time to raise money? <laughs> oh, man. When you don't need it <laughs> is the right answer. Yeah. <laughs> so we look at that. And so the, the passion that an entrepreneur has, does that trump? you know, other things, or do you have to have a combination of the good financials, the product and the market, the signaling from the investor? Yeah, I, I think you still have to have some of the fundamentals. If you don't have passion, I'm already out. Mm -hmm. I, it's actually a prereq for me. Um, and let me tell you this too, since you're doing a kind of a competition here, and maybe you'll do other competitions. By the way, there's more than just here, right? There's tons of them in town. They, honestly, you ought to be doing it. If you're gonna do this once, go do it 10 more times. Right, so that's my first tip, but because um, you're gonna get better every time too. Um, but your stage presence, your ability to come up here and confidently talk about your product or service and the passion that you're gonna bring to this. If you're not as passionate as I am right now, talking to you, you're already on like second place, you know. Find something you're passionate about. And if you're not passionate about it, please go work somewhere. There is nothing wrong with that. <laughs> vast majority of you are going to end up working for someone else, even though you want to be an entrepreneur and start your own company. That's just the reality of the world. The vast majority of you are also going to fail when you start your companies. It's also the reality of the world. But kudos to you if you push forward and you do it anyway, because it'll be one of the most rewarding and you will learn more doing this than almost anything you could ever imagine. So find something you're passionate about. I hope you're super passionate about the environment and it wasn't just a cool idea. You know, I hope you're passionate about your unique medical condition and the fact that you can help other people with that. That's huge. Are you kidding me? Like, let that passion just spill out and show people. But yes, back it up with the fundamentals. Show me or other investors you thought this through. Good time to open up questions. Hey, you just like, this is a good fireside chat. This <laughs> I'm, I'm like, wow, this is amazing. <laughs> what questions do you all have for us? I mean, I got some questions for you too. <laughs> so, no, no, it's all you have to ask. Yeah. Yeah. I'll Brett, start Madison. off with a question. Um, you guys were talking a lot about financials, but you touched on market too. And I know in our pitch, you guys are going to be talking about your markets. And how do you think, like, what's the best way to do light market research to be, to, you know, flesh out your presentation a little bit more? It's to build, measure, and learn. Piece there. And so you're going to prototype as fast as possible. Uh, you're going to get feedback from the market pieces there that have actual things that are available viable products. Um, if it's going to be the tire, 
Um, you know, you got to figure out pieces of that tire. It's going to be the actual tire you got to throw on a bike. You take it up to Cuba Mountain Lodge. You can ride the trails that we have up there. You know, from the mountain biking piece and see if they can hold up to the rugged part of you know, that, that part of the world. Um, you know, do the kits. You know, as, as minimal as it might be, enough that people will actually want to take it and grab it and buy it and so forth. Get it to it. Take the money out of the pocket. Don't do surveys. You know, just basically say, "Hey, yeah, I got a guy to it." I did that in 1998, by the way. <laughs> did not work, right? Um, I had actually 17 of the best golf course superintendents on my board of advisors, right? And then basically we went out and talked to people and every single superintendent we talked to, it was actually a, a, a portal to buy and sell uh, fertilizer and grass and equipment back in 1998. They all said, yeah, you know, we'll do it. Went out, you know, basically did it. The first one in the market, right? zero paid for it, zero, all right? So we had to pivot, you know, and then we ended up doing something different out of that piece there. But you're actually going to be hitting the markets um, and, and basically getting the feedback from people and then iterate as fast as possible. So I, yeah, I would recommend it. So, yeah. Add to that? That's good. Um, small part. Um, where you hear these things like fail faster, fail forward, failing up, like all these you know catchy terms that someone writes a book about. That's what this is. They're talking about trying something and failing and learning and having iterative improvement, right? That's testing the market in real time. That's why that's so important. It's because you have that's the only way to really know. Everything else is academic. <laughs> but see, Blake says, you know. You know the best business plan basically when it hits the marketplace is wrong. 100% of the time. <laughs> and also, um, so there's something that people don't think about, and it's easy because you get really busy as an entrepreneur, but business plans are supposed to be living documents, right? Most of the time, probably 99% of the time with a rounding error to 100, it's like it goes in a drawer. I'm too busy running my company. I don't have time for that. What are you, crazy? You know, it's like, you, you really ought to be taking like every quarter, like a day, like a Saturday, whatever it takes, get out of your office, get out of your comfort zone, go somewhere else, whatever you do to unwind. I don't care if it's drink a craft brew or go sit on top of the mountain, whatever it is that you do, right? Go for a swim, do something, and then like get a notebook out and get your business plan out and then just read it and chop it up and go, oh, oh gosh, wow, that was so wrong, right? And update it. Think about it. It will cause you to realize and reflect. Like I've come this far, and what it does is it's a it's, it's a learning tool that shows you how and it gets you to think. I might be wrong today as well. If I thought that and now I'm here, man, what else am I wrong about right now? That's an assumption that I made previously. You'll start to think a little bit differently about it. Yeah. Now what? Uh, any other questions? By the way? Yeah. So let's go ahead and concentrate. Uh, on questions that you have that um, you're not afraid to, to ask about. And just so that you know, first prize in the iChallenge versus Prime competition is uh, been raised. So you've got $2,500 if you win first prize. Second place is 1000 and and third place is 500 So just to kind of go on what they were discussing, a judge could very well ask you, hey, uh, if you win today and you get $2,500, what are you going to do with that money? Okay. Uh, and that sort of dovetails with, with what, where they are. But the other thing that could be a little confusing is you've been through three-day startup. You've been through ideas for innovation. This is actually the business plan competition where you're not required to present a written um, business plan. We we used to do that, okay, but it was hard to get judges at the end of the semester to go through 50 pages of pro formas that are fantasies uh, to some extent. Mm -hmm. And and so one of the things that you might ask is, well, what's going to be different about this pitch uh, from you know the um, the lean uh, canvas approach, which does not have all the elements uh, of, of go to market, for example, or finance. Um, any, there are no stupid questions here because you're going after the price money, and, and so feel free. I mean, we couldn't pay, uh, you know, Dr. Mueller or, uh, you know, Trustee Ragland enough money uh, to be here if they if we went out to get them engaged as consultants. So they're here uh, and they're willing to share their time. So your questions. Yeah. 
Anything you want to ask? Sorry, sorry. Um, when it uh, when it comes to or being in like the the, the pre seed phase or trying to or pre revenue, um, reaching out to people that will be using your product, uh, do you heavily emphasize the uh, incentive of like being in the beta phase? Like, if I were to reach out to Interior Designer to use my software, like, oh, you'll get a lifetime once we launch, lifetime like free service once we launch because it's. It's going to be, I'm hoping to aim to get like six interior designers to kind of like test it out. I got a builder to work with me right here. Um, so hopefully, um, do I have to like heavily emphasize like, oh, we'll do this and this if you kind of use our product, but or should I let the product itself be like, okay, this is going to be beneficial for me. So let's test it out and see how it'll work. You'll know it better than me. Okay. Because you'll know the industry in terms of how that target market to act. If they want a freebie or if they want something that basically is paid for or if they're even willing to do something in beta phase because hey you know what i, I can't risk you know doing a, a building um, with the interior design and so forth so um you know i can sit there and talk to you about other examples but you're ultimately going to know and put the pieces together that basically would tell okay do i do it for free do i need six do i need five different products um, anyone know the, the uh, icon, uh, you know, the 3D printing company that's here in Austin? Very well. They do. Right. They do 3D printing here. So, and, and they, they hit it, you know, pretty big this last year um, with things. Um, and so um, you watch what they had to do. They just had to do a, a prototype on that piece there. And, and you go talk to them. They have to do that for free, right? Do they have to go to the city to do the programming and so forth? They have to pay the money and so forth to get that first prototype in place so they can have people walk through that. Right, so they actually had to figure that out on a, on a scale of yep, I had to get that for basically on my own dime as opposed to the city or a, a developer paying for that. Whereas maybe you know for um, biking, you know, it might be a little bit different. Say you know what, I don't want to risk going to the, the uh, um, Copper Harbor you know trails and do the um, um, uh, trails fast and, and uh, Labor Day because it's going to risk me getting injured. So I need basically have further tested and so forth. Different pieces that are going to be working that out based upon what the risks are. And you're going to know it better than I think any, any investor. The investor is going to give you different you know, ideas to think about. But ultimately, you're going to need to be able to put that to, together you know, with, with that. And I've seen it multiple ways, by the way, in the construction tech and the property tech and the real estate tech um, in terms of you know, if you want to offer it for free or not. Ultimately, though, you have to do what? You have to have it where it's paid for. Well, so, yeah, absolutely. So, absolutely. So he's right, absolutely. I mean, it'll be different for every industry, and it'll also be different for every person you go talk to. There is no cookie cutter answer to that question, unfortunately. Um, as a person who's built almost a thousand houses, though, I can tell you from some experience, we did get to use like some beta software from a couple of companies, and it was interesting because I allowed different people in my company to make the decision, and they went about it very differently. And so that further emphasizes it's different for everyone. You know, like one guy just loved the product so much he couldn't wait to get his hands on some feedback and show them <clears throat> if you did these things, it'd be even better. He loved that. He was participating in the process. He wasn't even thinking, do I get a free ticket? And then I had another guy that was like, this is really great. We have a similar product. It cost me a bunch of money, like 10 grand a year. Um, if you guys will give us a free license for the next three years, I'll give you unlimited consulting, right? They thought differently. But it's just, you're just going to have to go out there and try it out. See what happens with every person. Thank you. Maybe they make you wear a shirt. It's cool. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but at the end of the day, you got to get them to pay for it. So yeah. when the steps you get there uh, might be different than each industry and each person we're talking to. Yeah, a good example of a fail on that is um, this company I was advising for a while. They created like a freemium model early on to, to get access to a marketplace and to test it. And they were pretty successful. And then they built their entire thesis on like how look at the large scale, like all of this. We've got all of these people. We've built up a critical mass. They're all giving us all the data, everything we need. Now we're ready to go to a paid version. And it was like, no one wanted it. And think about it. They were like, oh man, what are we doing? So they had to completely pivot their business model. And they were like, we clearly can't charge the user because they're not willing to pay in this industry. We didn't know that. Um, so how do we monetize the data we're acquiring all of this? And do we own the rights to that data? It was, it was tough. 
you know, we ended up not investing in the company because it was too unclear. All of his premise of what he had wasn't that valuable. He had done so much work too, but he didn't test his marketplace right. Bummer. Hard lesson. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, something that um, I kind of wonder about is, you know, asking for help, asking for help, you know, when starting a business, it's always great to get feedback and get support, mentor, however that role may be. Um, and you also experience, has there, can you ask for too much help? And can that ever, you know, actually, is there a time when you need to say, okay, that's too much help to ask for, and you need to kind of change something, or have you all faced any kind of encounter like that? I don't know if you could ever ask for too much help, but I have seen people get stuck in the mode of always soliciting for feedback, and that's just all they end up doing for years. And then they get contrarian opinions, and then the market changes, and I'm like, you know, you missed your window. That thing that you made would have been really cool a year ago, you know. So I, I, my advice would be find like two or three people with two or three different backgrounds, you know, that you trust that will are also willing to commit to the time. It's great to have some oh such stuff on my advisory board, but if they don't spend time with you, who cares? You know, unless you need their name to raise money or something, like who cares? Find some people that are going to commit, sit down and work with you, and for good reason, you know. Um, and then find what you know. I guess we used to call it smart money. I don't know what it's called now, but like when you find an investor, find an investor who's not just the money, but they know your industry, right? Or they're retired from the industry and they know all these people. They can call you, build a Rolodex, or they've done what you're doing in another version, another life. Like find someone who's willing to not only invest in your company, but spend the time to help you and mentor you and be a valuable contribution. Ideally, everyone in investor company you want to look like that. It won't be that way if you raise a decent amount of money, but you know that's who you should be looking for. To add on to that, uh, ends up being you know you uh, if you have information rights to investor, you get monthly updates and so forth, and you learn to give and take. And so you know those information rights, you you know mostly um, the two or three page uh, update is going to be providing information to investors. You're giving something to the investor in regard. At the end, you're seeing an ask. Hey, you know, in, in the ask the days, it's talent. You know, you, you know someone that is a coded developer in X, Y, Z, um, uh, you know, language and so forth, it's Python and so forth. And so, you, you know, if, if you make it too one-sided and you're only asking, as opposed to you know, you know, giving something back, it is a relationship. Um, then you could also get swayed a little bit where, hey, you know what, I, I'm too busy to do something today and so forth. But if you, if you can feel that balance, you know, with the give and take, I think you establish a, a, a good relationship with the investors and a good relationship with the mentors. Chris talked about getting different perspectives. That's really important on that piece there. Um, and realize that you're going to get what's called mentor whiplash when you do that. Um, but you, you need that because you're sitting in the center of, of things, you know, talking about understanding the industry. You know, Chris will understand, like, let's say you have Chris and I on, um, as, as mentors and Tony and, and, and Keith and, and Cliff and, and Wes, all right? You're going to get different perspectives from all of us, all right? And so what you have to do is take it and say, all right, basically compile it, say, all right, what is actually going to work from my perspective, what I'm looking at, what I understand the industry. And, and then we say, okay, this person has this expertise. And if you, you know, this one, I'm, I don't agree with John, you know, you know, because, you know, he's coming from a different angle at this point. And, and that's just fine. But you've taken it. And when you, when you've actually said that you disagree with it, you do it in a respectful manner, you're going to create a strong relationship, you know, with that piece there. And then you basically great, got a great mentor. Piece in, and you can ask as much as you want for help. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so, have you guys ever, like, I say, did a startup that was not doing well with sales or not doing well with certain aspects of the startup? Have you guys ever implemented the same, like, person to fill a certain role in a startup? Like, it was lacking in sales and ever brought, like, a salesperson in? Or, like, I guess, how hands on is it with, like, startups that you guys invest in or helping them grow? Depends on what investment Yeah, right, that's very true. I, I have broken myself of a bad habit and that is taking over startups and helping them run run their companies i've done that a bunch and that's so hard to do and 
not worth it. <laughs> um, honestly, you know, maybe that's me getting a little older, but um, yes, I've had to kind of come in and play rescue and say, okay, you're you're lacking someone with this skill set. You've been unable to bring them in. Let me help you. Let me install this type of a person. Most of the time, that doesn't work out. You know, it's like it's a that's the hill, man. You've already gotten there. If you're doing that kind of stuff with a founder, the founder should have been coming to you and saying, we lack a person with this skill set, like the coding example. Help me find this person. I can't find them. You know, that's where we should have been. Not, oh, I'm your investor. Let's have some tough talk. And I'm going to forcibly put someone in your organization to fix your issues. Oh, man, it's already toxic. Just thinking it through. And now I'm at a point now where it's like, I'm passive. I'll give you advice. I'll give you connections. If you're doing great, you know, or there's a extenuating circumstance, I might do a follow-on investment with you. But I'm not going to come in and help you and run your business. You know, mm -mm. not anymore. I've done that a bunch, and I've done some of them successfully. <laughs> it's just, man. Yeah. Was, oh gosh, it's such a heavy lift. It's like doing a turnaround job. You know, I'm like, why? I should have just bought another company that's already doing this. I was going to do that. That was dumb. Yeah. And investors don't want to get into business. They have to, you know, to save the money. Mm -hmm. um, they might. Uh, but you know, again, you need you want to ask them too. You know, can there, you know, it could be contrary to what I just said, that you have someone said, you know, I don't put money into it, and I actually want to, to to you know have it as my my day job. And so B you want to find that out pretty pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, mo most investors want to, you know. They're investing for it to be success without them having to do a lot of stuff. The vast majority, they're not your partner, they're your investor. You know, don't don't make an investor a partner. <laughs> it's just not gonna work out. They're gonna have a different vision than you, you're gonna be at odds, you know, they're probably coming in and taking more equity. It's just it just I don't know. It's incredibly rare to see that work out well. Yeah, thank you. Any more questions? Um we have to do one more. Oh, so. Um, so obviously both are important when you're doing a pitch, but when it comes down to it, do you prefer someone that has uh, an like in-depth financial planning, or do you prefer someone that has a lot of passion for their project? Like okay, so the the false dichotomy is where we are. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> The easy answer is both, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and eventually, you need to have both. Uh, so the question is, where that connection is? And I, I will tell you, just based on talking with, with Chris here, we'll have different perspectives mm -hmm. on it. Uh, I will lean more toward the passion if I had to choose. He'll lean more toward the numbers on that piece maybe, there. Maybe. So on that um, tool of thumb, you know, <laughs> heuristics, right? That's what entrepreneurs do. They you can't get everything. No, no. So. Found a rationale that you work on. So, um, what happens is understand the investors on that piece there. And, and, and being okay, I might invest in a company early on. Chris comes in, you know, at you know the second, third round, and those pieces there. I might do a follow up, but then I pull out, or not uh, pull out, but not you know invest in, in a third round. Chris then takes it to a bigger round. He's investing bigger dollars in that case, and so forth. So you're going to have to you adapt through that phase. And so early on. Since you don't have a lot of tangibility in the company, you're going to be banking on the passion and getting people to kind of, you know, be convinced in your your idea um, as as a leader and so forth. And that's actually a, a, a test too. Is if you can convince people to join you right, when you don't have you know a, a lot of revenue, you don't have a lot of, of, of funds behind you. That's a sign of a good leader. Then what happens? You know, you know, basically you take you know resources and pull them together. You didn't have. And create something that will you can execute on. That's good. I I saw the list of the teams and they all had one name on them. I was curious did, if I can if I may ask, do any of you have a partner in your concepts today? Okay, at least one of you. And that's a whole other conversation we don't have time for. But what I was going to say to your question, you know, if you were say lacking the financial side, you know, consider a partner who's going to be strong where you're weak, right? That level of synergy to me as an investor is really important. If all of the weight of the startup is on your shoulders, that's actually a concern, right? For an investor, I, I want to know who's your team? Like who's doing this and this and that? 
uh, I need to know those things, right? And if you're like, oh, that's me, oh, that's me. And I've seen very powerful founders, like I'm the lead on that. Oh, that's me again. I do that. I do that. And as soon as I start to set behavior, I'm like, yeah, no, not a healthy leader, not trying, you know, someone who can't, you know, delegate effectively, build a team environment where everybody has buy-in. And you know what you just said was really important. Like, you're starting a company, all you have is the promise of something that may not occur. <laughs> Think about that for a minute. It's like, why on earth would anyone follow you into battle and start this company? So if you've surrounded yourself with three or four other people that perhaps you're giving small pieces of the company to on that promise, it speaks volumes to you on who you are as a leader. And so for me as an investor, I'm reading that and I'm like, wow, she's already assembled a team of people. She's got her finance person. She's got this really great product person, maybe a go-to-market sales strategy person. And they all want to believe in this and do the same product. That's that's pretty pretty powerful stuff right there. To sort of wrap up, um, you just have one more question. Go ahead. Uh, I mean, I can keep going. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> we, we're actually committed them for an hour, so we've been going for, for an hour. There will be a little bit of time uh, if I can persuade them to stick around to do one on one and network with them. And some of you may find that actually more valuable and because it's unique to your company and unique to your situation. So uh, what I wanna do is by way of wrap up is to dial this back a little bit. The build a business tutorial is really putting you on steroids. It's basically putting you even past the pitch competition by basically telling you is if you're serious about this, it's, you're gonna build a business and it, it's, it's more than just pitching on April 23rd, okay? It is about encompassing a lot more than we are possibly able to cover in your pitch. But to dial it back is I'd like to ask, um, you know, Trustee Raglan and, and Dr. Muller to say, uh, hypothetically, they'd have five slides on their PowerPoint at, at, at the pitch competition, okay? Maybe give or take two or three, right? But five is, is, is a nice round number. What would you like to see in those five slides? Okay, I mean, I've done this enough times, it should be super easy for me, right? Um, first thing I like to see is, I wanna see the market problem you're solving, like right out the gate. What the heck are you solving? Even, I don't care who you are yet, okay? Tell me like, and don't make it corny. <laughs> Imagine a world, no, do not do any of that theater, okay? But tell me the problem that you're solving, that's slide number one, okay, cool. Now tell me who you are and why it's relevant and why you're passionate about solving that problem. That tells me who the team is already. Now tell me about the actual product that you've got that you want to do or service or whatever that's going to solve this problem. Talk to me about how big that marketplace is and how you're going to address it and how much money you think you can make. And then ask me for money <laughs> and tell me how much you want and how much you need. You know, And, and those are my five slides. Yeah, off the cuff right there. If you can give me those five slides, I'm excited to see it. So I do that. Okay, we'll make it 10 slides. Hey. Oh, that's <laughs> it's okay, 10 slides. <laughs> go ahead, go for it. All right, so I checked it off here, right? So you got problem, solution, market size, the team, the funding, right? That's, that, that's yours there, right? Yeah, yeah, right. Um, the, the title slide, all right? So the thing about that happened is, you know, when you look at that, that name, have a tagline that, uh, that actually says something about the company so you get people in mind of what it is. Don't, don't get over um, uh, exaggerated and use you know, special terms. Say, this is, this is an educational tech company. Boom, right there. This is a 3D printing company so that you know, basically they know where you, you are at real quick. It puts people in the frame of mind. Is it a biotech company? Is it you know, basically a property tech company and so forth? Is it a sports company and likes? All of a sudden, you got people now that dialed in. They've been thinking about all their stuff in the daytime, and now it's their day. Now I know where to go. All right, I can say, yeah, no, I don't want to listen anymore because you know it's not in my own wheelhouse. As well, quick no. Um, add to that competition. You know, basically figure out where you are on a two by two or a, a table so that you know where you sit and what makes you different and what's you know going to set you apart for that piece there. Um, and then the go to market strategy. So, how are you going to touch the, you know, the market and so forth? Is it going to be something where you go into a distributor for the tires, or it's going to go where you wholesale and so forth there? Um, and I did put my input forecast in there. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, and, but what happens is you, 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 you know, the caveat is basically on what assumptions that you're, you're running on as opposed to hockey stick or J curve and so forth. 
And that's something that I, I feel is that, um, think about too, asking for money is not to get you to be successful. Asking for money is to basically change the curve. So what happens is you should be successful without getting any external money if you have a good idea and a good marketplace and a good team. What the money does, it changes that trajectory from here to here. And so that's when it makes it easy to, to raise, raise money with that piece there. And rather than taking 10 years, it's going to take you five years to get to a certain point when you actually ask for the money on the piece there. And then a lot of people forget this at the end. Thank you and contact information. <laughs> right. they, they, they forget that. Um, and then they'll go past those, those 10 slides or five slides on that piece there. But do have an appendix on that piece there. So what happens is you know, the Q&A is where the real meat happens. And it happens if you have a slide that answers that question in the Q and A piece. Yes, gold. Boom, you know, solid gold. Because then you know what you know, there. So when you do that pitch, what I what I think is good is that think about what question you want someone to ask that signals that you provide the information you want to provide to the next. That's 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 a solid gold. Be like a common one I see that I'm always impressed with. They'll have like their three year super high level financials on the side, and I'll drill in and ask a tough question financials wise. And they'll go to their last slide and says thank you and they'll skip forward to like third or four and then they'll have that crazy financials that no one can read from out here and they'll go oh well over here actually what we thought was this and i'm like okay you know and it's it's a great and by the way this is a little little bit of theater but like taking any the first question that comes at you use it as an excuse have a bunch of appendices and jump into them suddenly they're like well what else is over here you know like wait a minute you got all this other material behind your presentation that you didn't have time for that's i'm already curious like i want to know like what else have you done the homework on this is pretty cool so it's it's a really great strategy to have tons of backup information behind your presentation if you're doing a presentation format yeah let's give uh trustee raglan and dr Mueller a big round of applause for their <laughs>